This is Dr. Eric Osansky, and in this video, we're going to go over a GI map case study so that you can better understand how to address some of the common imbalances found on this DNA-based comprehensive stool panel. Before watching this, it might be a good idea to first watch my GI map overview video. Before I begin, I just want to remind you that the main reason I put together these videos is to help people with different types of autoimmune conditions and other health issues better understand their test results so that they can find and remove their triggers, correct any underlying imbalances, and feel great again. I need to let you know that this video is not meant to be used as medical advice or as a recommended treatment protocol, and it isn't a replacement for consulting with a competent healthcare practitioner. Before diving into this case study, I want to let you know that I'm first going to discuss the findings of this test, and then I'll discuss the different treatment options. On the first page of the GI map, you'll find the GI pathogens, and in this report, you'll see toxin E. coli under the bacterial pathogens over here. So even though it isn't red flag as being positive, since it's below the range listed on the right, Ideally, you want all of the GI pathogens to be below the detectable limit, which is not the case with this bacteria. As for how this bacteria is transmitted, one of the more common ways is through the fecal contamination of ingested foods, such as undercooked meat. Symptoms associated with this bacteria include severe abdominal cramps and diarrhea. And you can see that all of the parasitic pathogens, as well as viral pathogens, are below the detectable limits. On the second page of this report, you can see that H. pylori is below the detectable limits, and as a result, the virulence factors are all negative. But we do see some imbalances of the normal bacterial flora. So you can see that Enterococcus species is low. Um, Enterococcus is a gram-positive bacteria, and low levels may indicate an insufficient amount of beneficial bacteria. And this is actually the case with all the bacteria in this section. Now, Escherichia is also low on this report. Escherichia is a gram-negative bacteria and low levels may indicate reduced mucosal health. And here we see the bacteroidetes and formicutes. Um, these are bacteria phyla that dominate the entire human digestive tract. Some causes of low phyla include poor diet, dysbiosis, maldigestion, as well as low stomach acid levels. And on this report, we can see that the bacteroidetes are low. We'll now move on to the opportunistic bacteria section, specifically the, the additional dysbiotic overgrowth bacteria. Although there is nothing outside of the reference ranges listed here, you can see that Bacillus species is detectable. Uh, bacillus are a group of gram-positive bacteria, and some strains are included in probiotic supplements. They are known as spore-based or soil-based probiotics, and high levels not only can be related to supplementation with these probiotics, but also can be related to reduced digestive function, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, or constipation. Staphylococcus aureus is another bacteria that is detectable in this report. Uh, these are gram-positive bacteria, and high levels may result from reduced digestive capacity or gut inflammation or both, both of these problems. Sometimes this could cause lo loose stools or diarrhea. And we also see Streptococcus species as detectable in this report. These are gram-positive bacteria, and high levels may result from low stomach acid, proton pump inhibitors, reduced digestive capacity, or, as well as small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Um, sometimes Streptococcus can result in loose stools. And we can see that, if we scroll down here, that all the potential autoimmune triggers are below the detectable limits, which is great news. And we could also see that the fungi yeast are all below the detectable limits. And just as a reminder, if all these are negative, it does not rule out a yeast overgrowth. And cytomegalovirus and Epstein-Barr virus are both negative, but this doesn't mean that these viruses can't be problematic. And the best place to look at these viruses are in the blood. Let's go ahead and take a look at the parasites, which include protozoa and worms. Cyclospora species is clearly elevated on this report. This usually is transmitted by fecal contamination of food and water, and it can cause symptoms such as watery diarrhea, abdominal cramping, loss of appetite, 
weight loss, nausea, as well as vomiting. It could also cause bloating, flatulence, and burping. And you can see that there are no worms detected on this report. So let's move on to the intestinal health markers. So under digestion, there is elastase 1 and steatocrit. So elastase 1 is a digestive enzyme secreted exclusively by the pancreas, giving a direct indication of pancreatic function. And even though elastase 1 is within the normal lab reference range listed on the right, an optimal level would be greater than 500 micrograms per gram. And here it's, you can see it's 313. Steatocrit is just barely within the lab reference range as it's on the high side at 14. So I would still suspect that there might be some fat malabsorption present. Under GI markers, we see that beta-glucuronidase is within the lab reference range and there was no occult blood detected, which is great news. And then under immune response, we see that secretory IgA is within the lab reference range as is the anti-gliadin antibodies. And then under inflammation, you can see calprotectin, uh, which is looking pretty good at 19 micrograms per gram. Before talking about the treatment options, let's look at a summary of the findings. So this person had shiga-like toxin E. coli, although it was not above the detectable limits. They had some low normal bacteria flora and low bacteroidetes. There was some overgrowth of bacteria. And one of the main findings was the person testing positive for cyclospora, which is a parasite. The elastase 1 was less than optimal, and the steatocrit was on the high end. So how can we help this person? We, of course, always want to address the basics, such as eating well, doing a good job of managing stress, as well as getting sufficient sleep. Prebiotic foods and supplements are important for supporting the good bacteria, since some of these were low and consuming probiotic foods and supplements can help combat the bacterial overgrowth we saw. This person might want to consider doing something to support stomach acid production, such as taking betaine HCL with meals high in protein, or if they prefer, they could take bitter herbs or apple cider vinegar to help stimulate acid production. Because the elastase 1 was less than optimal and the steatocrit was on the high side, this person might want to consider taking pancreatic enzymes that include lipase, then taking bile salts or ox bile, something to consider. Since this person had a parasite, an antiparasitic protocol is something to consider. While sometimes prescription antibiotics are necessary for parasites, some herbal antimicrobials to consider taking are oregano oil, wormwood, and black walnut. Is additional testing necessary? As usual, it depends on the person. If someone has an autoimmune condition, the parasite can definitely be a significant finding, although there is always a chance that other triggers and underlying imbalances can be present. If you found this video to be valuable, please click on the like button below. And to get the latest videos to help you better understand your test results, make sure you subscribe right now and ring that notification bell, and I'll catch you in the next video.